Hi everyone, thank you for joining us this, this morning. This meeting is being recorded. There we go, sorry, interrupted there. Um, good morning everyone, uh, lovely to, to have you all with us this morning for our webinar. We're, we're just going to start in the next couple of minutes, we'll just give everyone a couple more minutes to, um, to kind of sign on and join us, but uh, in the meantime, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat, let us know where you're coming from. Um, it'd be great to kind of see who we've got with us and where around the world we've got people dialing in from. Um, yeah, we'll just we'll start in a couple of minutes. Peru, we've got Eddie from Peru. Welcome, Eddie. Karen from Edinburgh, a fair trade city. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us. We've got people from York, from Bristol. Morning, Lorraine. Morning, Tracy. Morning, Sam from Somerset. Getting a real spread, which is lovely to see on a on a sunny Thursday morning. Estonia, Manchester. This is great. So I hope everyone uh, is enjoying the sunshine like like I am here in I'm calling in from just outside St Albans, just outside of London. Um, but wonderful here and wonderful to see we've got so many people joining us. Uh, we'll just give it another 30 seconds or so and then we'll then we'll kick off. Gemma from Taiwan. Wow. Real a real global webinar today. So that's, that's love, lovely to see the interest from uh, from so many different people. Um, so I think Somebody we've got up at 5 a.m. in Peru. That, I mean that, that that is a that is a strong commitment. 5 a.m. from Eddie. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, appreciate your commitment to the webinar. Um, well, look, we've got we've got quite a few people who have joined us now. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll we'll kind of kick off the webinar. Uh, and a warm welcome to to everyone here from London to Glasgow to Peru to Taiwan. Um, wonderful to have so many of you joining us. Uh, and and thank you for for taking your time out of your day to be with us uh, this morning. Um, my name's Will, and I'm kind of mo I'm moderating this webinar today. Um, I head up the partnership development team at the Fairtrade Foundation in the UK. Um, I've been with Fairtrade for just over 18 months now, uh, and I've worked in a couple of different sectors, including retail and hospitality. Um, but now I focus on uh, our new partnerships and, and winning partnerships with organizations that are kind of new to working with Fairtrade. Um, Today we've got a really, really exciting webinar uh, and a fantastic topic as we take a look at the beauty and wellness sector. Now, this is a sector that is booming, um, but with a lot of different trends such as organic, veganism, cruelty-free, and a host of other sustainability credentials, uh, which is kind of representative of the fact that consumers are increasingly conscious of the products that they buy. But what about the people behind those products? Well, today's webinar is gonna take a look at how the sourcing decisions made within cosmetics, the beauty sector, health food, can affect the people that are growing the, the ingredients that are central to those products. After all, clean beauty doesn't just mean without the use of pesticides. Um, Cruelty-free doesn't just mean vegan. For a business to consider themselves as truly sustainable, they must consider all different aspects of their impact. Um, first off, I'm just going to go through a couple of housekeeping, bits of housekeeping for the webinar. Um, this session is going to be recorded. Uh, and we're doing that so that you can share with family, for friends, with colleagues, anyone that you think might be interested afterwards. Um, we have a chat function, which I'm pleased to see that people have discovered. Please feel free to chat and put comments in that. Um, and do ask some questions as well, because we're going to have some time at the end of the webinar to put a couple of those to our uh, amazing panel. Um, and also interact with our polls. So we're actually launching one of the first of those polls right now. Uh, so you should see a, a pop up on your screen. Um, before today, how much did you know about fair trade in the well-being and cosmetics industry? So a couple of those coming up through, please feel free to answer those and, and kind of interact with those. And, and while you're thinking about that first one, um, I will start to introduce our fantastic panel that we've got with us today. So thank you both so much for being with us today and taking time out and bringing your expertise here to, to help us through this fascinating topic. Uh, we're truly grateful for, for your time. Um, first off, we've got Tommy Matthew. So Tommy has a wealth of experience in cashew farming uh, and with fair trade actually. 
Uh, he's a founding member of the Fair Trade Alliance Kerala, which has a current membership of over 4,000 Fair Trade certified cashew farmers. Um, they don't just produce cashews, they also produce coconut, coffee, other spices. Tommy is currently involved in gaining Regen Agri certification for FTAK, and is also the founding director of uh, the managing director of Elements. Um, on top of all of that, Tommy is also a former board member of the Fair Trade Foundation, so very familiar with Fair Trade. So um, thanks very much for being here today, Tommy. Um, and we also have, have with us. Thank you for having me, Will, and thanks uh, for this opportunity too. No, thank Interact you. Interact with fair trade supporters after a fairly long time. Um, great to have you. Um, and our second panelist today is Anna Barker. So uh, Anna is my colleague at Fair Trade Foundation, and she is the head of responsible business for the Fair Trade Foundation. She has worked on responsible sourcing, ethical trade, and sustainable supply chains across a whole host of different commodities over the last seven years. She's incredibly passionate about working with businesses to create fairer and better working conditions for farmers. So Anna, thank you so much for joining us as well. We are also gonna have two testimonials, um, as well as our live panelists, we've got two testimonials from businesses that we work with at Fairtrade, who are going to explain to us in their own words why Fairtrade uh, is so important to them and, and why that's a choice they've made for their business. Uh, we have Deborah Grell, who is speaking to us from Liberation Foods uh, and is an internationally oriented supply chain professional. She has great experience working across the whole of supply chain, so from supply, uh, supply planning to demand planning to customer collaboration. She is passionate about continuous improvement and recently travelled to, to Kerala uh, in order to see sort of cashew farming and processing in action. As well as that, we have Mamanu, who have also sent a testimonial, and this is from Sam Thurlby Books who is the director of Mamanu. Uh, this is gonna bring a nice kind of skincare and cosmetics lens to our discussion. Mamanu is an independent beauty brand based in Somerset. And ever since childhood, Sam has been very passionate about doing the right things by animals, humans, and the environment. So her range of balms has had certified organic and fair trade at the heart and as a main focus since their launch in 2016. She's gonna to explain to us why she made that choice for her business and for those brands. So I hope everyone's as excited about that as I am. Um, and let's get started by talking to Tommy first. So um, Tommy, I was wondering, could you talk to us a little bit about your role at the moment, both as a cashew nut farmer, but also as the MD of Elements? Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, I, I think I wear too many hats at the same time uh, in this webinar. Uh, as I was introduced, I'm one of the founders of Fair Trade Alliance Kerala, which is a 4,000 strong smallholder farmer group that's located uh, on the hill tracks of the Western Ghats of Kerala. The Western Ghats, as some of you might know, is a world heritage site. I also head the trading arm of Fair Trade Alliance Kerala, which is a private limited company called Elements. Uh, which was involved in the founding of Fair Trade Alliance Kerala. Uh, we, we sort of strayed into fair trading our cashew uh, way back in 2005, six, when actually the, the cashew industry in this region probably had one of the worst track record in terms of its environmental credentials and in terms of uh, its occupational health hazards, and in terms of the debilitating impact that pesticide use in cashew plantations had uh, on the surrounding community. And our attempt since then has been to try and prove that cashew can be grown sustainably, cashew can be grown uh, organically, and cashew can be traded fair. And that journey is what you know, I have to talk about uh, in the course of this day for about the 16 year plus journey that we have been involved in. Yeah, amazing, Tommy. And you, you kind of touched on it a little bit there about the kind of conditions with, with cashew workers and why you set up elements. Um, perhaps you could talk to us a little bit more about the working conditions for your kind of average cashew, cashew worker. Well, the cashew worker, I hope you understand, you know, if you know the supply chain, there is a cashew farm where the fair trade 
constituencies, which is the smallholder cashew farmer. This cashew that is grown by the farmer is then processed at a cashew factory, where it is shelled, peeled, and then packed and exported all over the world. Now, the cashew farming per se, if you grow the farm, you know, if you grow your cashews in an environmentally sensitive manner, which means you avoid pesticides and chemicals, you know, it's fairly easily understood part of the supply chain where like any other farming, any other agricultural activity, you try and, uh, you know, uh, bring in sustainable principles and organic principles into the growing of cashew. What is actually very complex is the situation in the cashew factory where this cashew is processed. I don't know how many of you realize, but this, you know, cashew nut that you take and pop almost involuntarily as you sip your beer was at one point of time had to be individually touched by the human hand about 26 times. From picking the cashew from the, from the farm to drying it, to taking it to the factory, to blanching it, to shelling it, to several rounds of peeling it and then sorting it, cashews had to be manually handled about each individual nut at a time, about 26 times. You could call that handcrafted cashews by every sense of the term. But the human cost to that was, you know, very, very substantial. Because speed is what determined the cost of production. And to achieve speed, what was always compromised was the occupational health and safety of the cashew workers. The cashew shell has a very rancid liquid. It's called the cashew nut shell liquid, which is used in industry, it's used in shipbuilding. It's a, it's, it acts as a protective layer, but it's also extremely, you know, you can really burn your fingers, your, your, uh, your, so you can hurt yourself. So if you have to use proper gloves and make sure you're completely protected, then it affects your speed. And if you really need nimble fingers, then you get to the other level. Maybe you would find it more profitable or to achieve greater speed if you deploy child labor. It is to this industry that I would say, you know, the, the, the eyes and ears of the world got opened and actually made a serious case for fair practices. And thankfully, it is around that time when world's eyes and ears were opening to the cashew industry that fair trade cashews began in, you know, set its foot in, in Kerala. 2005, 2006, when the world was talking about what was the fate of cashew workers who were involved in this manual production was also the time when the enabling conditions of fair trade the scrutiny that fair trade inspection regimes had, you know, took a microscopic view of the activities in a cashew factory. Yeah, and I mean, suddenly realized that there is a premium for humane working conditions. There was a fair trade price that you could fetch if you ensured that the factory conditions were humane, con you know, conducive to occupational health and safety. Uh, I don't know if you want me to elaborate further or you will come back with questions yeah. because I could go on about what are the health hazards <laughs> linked to a cashew factory, but you know, but then I would probably occupy most of your time. I would rather that you ask. No, me. look, look, that was, in, I mean, that was incredibly informative. And I think, you know, um, as you say, you don't necessarily think about it when you pick up a cashew that you're having with your beer, at, in, in your own words, um, you don't necessarily think about that side. Um, I it'd be great for you to, to, to just sort of, yeah, talk a little bit and elaborate a little bit more on that in terms of um, what the difference that fair trade makes um, to those conditions and why that's important to you. Uh, let's look at one simple criteria, uh, you know, for, for, you know, just as an example. Trade union rights are mandatory under fair trade. Workers' right to organize, unionize themselves is, you know, 
a given in a fair trade situation. So in, in, a, in a situation where cashew factories were actually shipping out of Kerala or moving out of Kerala because the labor laws here were quite, quite tight. And people were shifting their factories en masse to neighboring states where the labor laws were, laws were fairly lax. You suddenly realized that observing labor laws, ensuring trade union rights actually served as a USP for your cash. So from this flight of industry from Kerala, because you were protecting or you were, you, you were investing in protection of labor rights because legislation was like little more tight, you reversed or you helped find a new sustainable, justice tuned global marketplace because you were protecting labor rights. So the red flag before cash factories in Kerala, which was seen as a bane of industrial development in Kerala, suddenly became a sign to promote, protect, tell the world that this was a place where cash workers' rights were protected. So you have a situation where the social standards of fair trade suddenly find market acceptance and social sanction in Kerala or acceptance in Kerala. This is just one example. So for, or take the issue of child labor where, you know, while that practice probably is not prevalent in Kerala, it has been the bane of cashew industries across India. And you have a situation where the fair trade certification itself serves to prove that this is a product where child labor is strictly not involved. So any condition of, of uh, worker safety, abhorrent practices like child labor, trade union rights, minimum wages for workers, uh, gender parity in, uh, in, uh, in wages, all those conditions where the fair trade audit eye takes it, you know, you know, brings their lens on, suddenly become you know, areas where the rights of workers are protected and the industry standards are improved. Yeah, brilliant. And look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take something you said there and, and head over to Anna, if that's okay, because one of the things you mentioned there was about fair trade being a USP for, you, for the cashews, right? Um, yeah. And let, let's kind of go over to Anna and just talk a little bit about consumer demand and trust for fair trade. Um, because it's great that it's seen as a USP, but Anna, you know, is there demand for fair trade within wellness products? Yeah, thanks, Will. And also thanks, Tim. It's so interesting. I don't know if you can see the chat, but lots of people commenting on how interesting that was. Um, and yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing it from a fair trade perspective, as well as the kind of broader market trends that are happening at the moment. Um, obviously, as we know, a vegan diet at the moment has never been so popular, plant-based ways of eating, uh, lots of those food containing ingredients, including cashew nuts that Tim has just spoken about. Um, with long supply chains. And I think as that shift in diets and the way that we consume continues, people are beginning to think about, well, where have those products come from? What do they mean? Where is an avocado from? And all of those pieces, um, as well as in the kind of beauty and wellness, uh, beauty and cosmetics industry too, far more people want to put natural products on their face. They want to be using kind of sustainable products in their daily routine. Um, and we're really kind of seeing that shift in consumer demand. Um, we're seeing it more broadly to the point that Nearly a third of all consumers now say that they are highly engaged with a sustainable lifestyle. Um, so really, really committed to those. And similarly, we're seeing something like 28% of consumers are actually prepared to stop buying a product if they don't think it aligns with their ethical values anymore. Um, so it is translating into kind of really clear consumer action um, and in particular for fair trade too. So we've got 58% of consumers saying that they're much more likely to choose a fair trade labeled beauty or wellness product and as high as 69% saying that for dried fruit, nuts, and coconuts. So I think big trends going on in this space, lots of people wanting to buy these products more and more, and increasingly aware of what the issues are, who, you know, human rights and supply chains, um, and really trying to make the right choice about it. And as for us at Fairtrade, we're really seeing that as a trend coming through. Yeah, really interesting. And you're saying about translating to consumer action. What is it that customers are looking for now? 
Yeah, I mean, what they aren't looking for is greenwash. So they really, really want to know what is a brand or company actually doing um, to support sustainability. Um, and then they're prepared to make the choice. So, um, you know, one study found that 90% of uh, consumer products uh, that were marketed as sustainable were outselling the conventional um, sort of version of that product. But at the same time, it's obviously not just enough to market it. It needs to kind of be verified and checked. And that's why as fair trade, we're continuing to see kind of the stats and awareness around our brand really, really stay strong. You know, 90% awareness in the UK and 80% trust. People really want to know that someone else has checked that supply chain um, and that, you know, a trusted body like fair trade is coming in to confirm that this is a fair trade product that you will be buying. Um, and so I think that's the kind of key thing that customers are looking for is what's the story and how do they know that what you're saying is true? And that's where obviously fair trade is kind of a great tool for businesses to be using. Yeah, interesting. And, and you're sort of saying about looking for, seeking for sustainability, but you know, what, what does sustainability mean within wellness? Yeah, I think it's such a good question. I think it's such an important one because I think where particularly when you're thinking about wellness and cosmetics, there's going on such a journey where up until now it's been considered more sustainable to eat a vegan lifestyle or to use natural products or put on cosmetic brands that, you know, um, yeah, aren't using lots of chemicals. But I think that's now moving forward into what's actually the story behind those supply chains and how do you know that if you're going for a plant-based diet and you want to be better for the environment for that, are the ingredients sourced in those products also environmentally friendly? And so it's been, you know, kind of um, cruelty-free on cosmetics is a big one and organic and all of those kind of brands are really, um, really, really key in this space. But I think it's also really important to get to know those supply chains because the issues do vary. So Tony's obviously spoken about cashew nuts, you've got issues with child labor, um, with health and safety, with kind of environmental challenges that come with that. And that's a cashew nut. You look at avocados, you've got water use, you've got um, informal supply chains in the way that they're traded. Um, in lots of other nuts, there's issues around gender and shea butter, you've got kind of, you know, women out wild harvesting the shea nut. Um, and if they're not protected, then there's lots of, you know, health and safety issues that come from that. Um, so I think it really varies by the supply chain, um, but taking that look at what is the environmental impact of that product and what's the human rights lens on that? Who are the people involved in making it? Are they treated fairly? Are there opportunities for empowerment? How are they involved in the supply chain? What measures are in place to protect them? I think that's a really, really important step towards addressing sustainability in this space. And you, you kind of touched on there the, the number of different uh, different different aspects of sustainability within wellness, but um, you can see how it could be quite overwhelming for consumers, right? Knowing what to kind of pick and, and you said yourself there to avoid greenwashing. Um, what's the difference between fair trade and kind of other labels that we see out there on wellness products? Yeah, so I mean, fair trade is obviously um, third party verification. Um, so, and in particular, um, for anyone who's kind of thinking about how you would market this to your consumers, um, making kind of claims yourself without anyone coming in to check those um, is, you know, we know consumers struggle with that. If you're marking your own homework, what's there? And consumers are also quite overwhelmed by just how many marks are out there and different claims and what do they all mean? Um, obviously, fair trade is across multiple different products, which means that we've got that easy story to tell the average consumer and shopper about what we're doing. Um, we're audited by Flosa, so all supply chains have that third party verification through Flosa, our auditing body. We only have one auditor in the fair trade system and that's to prevent kind of tendering for audits and a race to the bottom and a competition on price. It means the same methodology is applied for all fair trade products. So we have that kind of assurance that comes through working with a body like Flosa, who's really coming in to check that what you know the fair trade standards are met and all of the other pieces um, are happening that should be fair trade. It means, and I think this is really important, particularly when you're comparing it to other labels, the difference with fair trade, and Tommy will speak to this you know, much more than I'm able to, is that minimum price and premium that comes with it. So, so, so many issues, like problems with these supply chains and the way that we consume, a lot of those are hard to fix if you don't have resources and access to resource for farmers. Um, and what we have is that minimum price as a guarantee of a price that you will sell your product up that enables farmers to plan their spending, plan farm inputs. They're able to have that security regardless of market volatility. And the premium is the extra money that's paid every time a fair trade product is sold. 
um, extra money goes back to the farmers and that's pooled and they decide how to spend that best. And I can't emphasize enough how important that is, particularly when you're thinking about climate change and big tangible issues. And even the things Tommy spoke about, you know, to fix a health and safety issue, you then need equipment, you need more protective equipment for workers and that's not free. And if you're not selling your product at a fair price and you've got no extra money coming back, you can't ask farmers to just be more sustainable when first and foremost, they're, they're a business and they need to sell their product. And that's the real difference of a fair trademark on a product is it's not just that it's met our standards and it's not just that it's you know, audited and verified and you can trust that. It's that you have supported farmers to earn the right price for their product and with extra resource to be able to invest in sustainability. And I think that's really, really important. Yeah, really important. Um, Anna, how, how do we work with partners to help them sell on fair trade terms? Yeah, I mean, for any business on the call who is thinking about this, just come and speak to us. Uh, we have teams here in London who um, are ready to, to kind of support you on it. We have offices in most countries. So anyone who's global, um, there's likely to be an office there for you. Um, we have different models you can work on. So um, we have a mark that enables you to label as many products um, and as many ingredients in a single product that could be fair trade as fair trade. So um, it might be, um, you know, the olive oil and the shea butter and something in a cosmetics piece. But we also offer a flexible model where if you just want to focus on one ingredient and source 100% of that single ingredient as fair trade, you can label that too. And that's what we call FSI. Um, and we acknowledge that, you know, it, you know, there's lots of steps and there's lots of ingredients and we really want to help you start your journey. And that model might help some businesses get going first, start with the cashew nuts and then look at other ones later. Um, but basically come and talk to us. Um, if you know where you're sourcing from and you know what your issues are, we'll help you map out fair trade producers and how you can work there. And if you don't, then we're more than happy to support you on that. So um, get in touch. Brilliant. Thank you, Anna. And, and that leads us quite nicely. Um, give the, the panellists a, a slight break as we um, go to some of our partner testimonials. So these are businesses that have just done exactly what Anna said. Um, and, they, you know, they've looked at the industry, uh, considered not only what is important and what is right for farmers as well, um, and what was important for their business. Um, so the first is a pre-recorded talk from Deborah Grell at Liberation Foods. Hi, I'm Deborah, and I'm the Supply Chain Manager of Liberation Foods. For those of you that are not yet familiar with us, we are the UK's only nut company that is majority owned by smallholder nut farmers. Over the last years, we've really felt the growing consumer demand for and interest in the origins and ethics of the products they consume. Nuts, as the main commodity we are dealing with, fits in really well with this trend because they're not only nutritious and healthy, but can also play an important part in a plant-based and environmentally conscious diet. Nuts as a crop have minimal greenhouse gas emissions compared to the majority of other foods. At the same time, our fair trade cashews from Kerala are a great example of how nuts can be used in plant-based diets as a substitute for animal-based products. We supply our cashews to several independent small businesses, such as Bose Gelato and 10th York, who use them in their products, and the results are very delicious. As a community interest company, with the community of interest being the worldwide smallholder farming communities, having really strong and reliable and long-standing relationships with the farmers is at the core of everything we're doing. At the same time, as we are fair trade certified, paying fair prices to those farming communities has always been a given for us as well. These relationships that are resulting from it can actually uh, provide a real competitive advantage for both businesses. In some cases, it can even provide vital economic security. A prime of example of that being that during the pandemic, Fair trade premiums were used in Bolivia to support vulnerable and isolated indigenous Brazil nut gatherer communities um, and help them to buy and distribute emergency relief packages and cover medical bills. At the same time, we see benefits to liberation foods as well. So, for example, during the pandemic, 
when a lot of international markets were struggling with uh, challenges in global shipping um, and the resulting disruptions, we could build on those relationships and build on all the trust and the um, length of the, those relationships to continue trading with our partners, such as Tommy and Elements and Carola, and uh, make sure that we still get product into our warehouses. A part of fostering these relationships is that we are trying to visit our partners as much as possible. And I was actually lucky enough that I was able to go to Kerala in the beginning of the last month and meet Tommy and some of the members of the Fair Trade Alliance Kerala as well as Elements. One thing that really stood out for me was that the uh, abundance of different crops that I could see. While I expected to see loads of cashews, what I saw on these farms was actually cashews in between uh, um, loads of other trees and plants such as coconuts, mango, pineapple, nutmeg, and I was even able to try some fresh honey from bees that are living on these farms. And personally for me, this really brought home the point of why it's so important to support these smallholder farmers over large monocrop farms as it's not only important for the people, but also for our planet. So having this diverse range of products, not only at Kerala, but also at our other origins, um, is playing a, an important part of where we are heading to in the future as liberation foods, as well as adding new um, own barn products to our to our current range, including healthy nut mixes, which will be available very soon. We are also looking at buying more value-added products directly from the source, so directly from the producers, such as sesame snack bars and edible oils. And buying those value-added products means that we are pushing the value of um, value up the supply chain, up to the uh, producer groups. And the, uh, um, and as we, as we are broadening our range, this is also one of the reasons uh, we've, that we've changed, recently changed our names from Liberation Nuts to Liberation Foods, for those of you that might have been following us for a bit longer and might have wondered. While we continue to produce big quantities of fair trade private label um, nut-based products for some of the UK's major retailers as well as uh, European customers, we are really looking at putting the focus more on our own brand. We, for example, just recently relaunched our website and presented our new look and launched our very first uh, own online store where you can, for example, get these nuts, these nut mixes, which are my favorite of our range. Um, having this online presence does also enable us to build trust in our brand and to really bring the stories of the cooperatives that we're working with to the heart of the business, while at the same time creating more awareness for the challenges that the farmers are, uh, that the farmers are experiencing, as well as challenges of the food industry as a whole. So while it's a very busy time for us, it's also super exciting to be a part of and there's loads more to come. Brilliant. <clears throat> I'm not sure about everyone else, but I am really looking forward to seeing those fair trade sesame snack bars and edible oils uh, on the shelves in the future. Um, we've now got another testimonial from Mamanu. Uh, Sam from Mamanu is going to take us through that. Hello, my name's Sam and I'm the creator and director of the Mamanu brand. Anything to do with balms, I make it. Balms for body, massage, face, lips, feet, hands and beards, as well as coughs and colds and private parts. I launched the balms in the UK in 2016 and have always had them registered with Fairtrade and or Soil Association Organic. I wanted to be sure that the products I sell are never abusive to animals, humans or the planet. Beauty should never be at the expense of somebody else's happiness because they are worth it too. I lived in New Zealand for about eight years and always used balms for my massage work because they're cleaner and easier to use than oils. 
When I returned to the UK in 2014, I wanted to create my own range of balms with ingredients that would add maximum benefit to a person's skin and well-being. Using shea butter, cocoa butter and coconut oil, I knew the only right way to do this would be to certify organic and fair trade. There are so many mainstream skincare brands that use organics from lower income countries and demand the cheapest and best deals from farmers and factories. Loads of ingredients in skincare come from shea, coconuts, olives, cocoa and palm fruit. By processing these, especially palm oil and coconuts, they're able to label the ingredients as other things like glycerin, cocoa caprolate, citral alcohol and glycerol stearate. To the average consumer, you wouldn't know that coconuts or palm oil were used in the products, let alone whether there were any environmental, animal or human rights violations caused by their production. Cocoa butter and shea butter are big business in the skincare industry. There are other organisations that have been set up to help stop child labour and slavery, control the price of cocoa and shea and provide farmers a safe platform for representation. The problem with these particular organisations is that they're owned and run by the companies that profit most from the ingredients. They're self-regulated organisations that allow companies to further their own interests in the disguise of promoting others. There's a current court case against one of these organisations for knowingly ignoring slavery. It doesn't make sense to trust organisations that are owned or run by the people who profit from the thing they're trying to stop. The Fair Trade Mark is the most iconic certification for fair trade products in the UK and internationally. There are other fair trade certifications, but Fair Trade International is the most recognised and covers production from farm to end product. This is really important to me as a manufacturer and brand owner for a couple of reasons. Firstly, consumers already know the logo and can trust it without needing to do lengthy research. Secondly, as a buyer of ingredients from lower income countries, I know that the Fair Trade Foundation and Soil Association regularly audit and inspect the farms and cooperatives to ensure standards are met. Not only have they done the hard work for me, they are also an independent third party. Claiming fair trade without any third party certifications is just greenwashing. Why should anyone believe a brand that makes such important claims without independent evidence? The fair trade marks makes my products better. From forcing in, from sourcing ingredients and updating formulas to packaging design and marketing, the Fair Trade Foundation have put my products a cut above the rest. Despite being more expensive than some other brands, people buy Mamanu Balms because they carry the Soil Association organic and fair trade marks. Very few skincare brands have both certificates and even fewer on every product they sell. I'm really proud that all Mamanu products carry both. Currently, I use organic and fair trade coconut oil from Sri Lanka and organic and fair trade cocoa butter from the Dominican Republic and Peru. Our shea butter from Ghana is certified organic, but I've not been able to get it in small quantities, both with certifications, with both certifications for about a year. I'm hoping it'll be available again within the next six months. Three Mumnu balms also contain organic and fair trade vanilla from Madagascar. By purchasing, purchasing certified organic and fair trade, I know that children and slaves have not been used to farm cocoa pods and women have not been taken advantage of in farming shea and vanilla. I know that farmers have earned a good price, the fair trade minimum price, and earned extra money for their community to use on great projects, the fair trade premium. I also know that fair trade farmers can access education and support in their businesses to help protect them against and combat climate change. I can pass all of this knowledge onto my customers with just a little logo on each of my products. By having the fair trademark on my packaging website and the Climate Pledge Friendly badge on Amazon, my sales in 2021 were fantastic. I've only been focusing on the balm since the end of 2020 as I was mostly massaging clients before that. I'm a specialist in pregnancy and postnatal massage and used to run that through the Mumnu brand. Now that I focus on just the products, my sales have shot up and doors have been opening. Fair Trade and Soil Association have both helped me with, with my success, providing various business opportunities and exposure to the right people. 
I run Mamanu on my own, but with Fair Trade and Soil Association, I feel like I have a team of people around me wanting me to succeed, promote my brand and support me when I need it. They're both highly respected platforms that media and buyers look, look at to source products and stories. There's loads of material I can use in marketing and heaps of advice they've given me over the years to make my products as great as they are. Fair Trade made it really easy for me to sign up with them as a startup because they only charge a small licensing fee spread out over the year when sales are low. I've made fair trade and certified organic a priority in my company, even when budgets have been tight, because it's the right thing to do. I sell beauty that everyone can feel proud of. Thank you both to uh, Deborah and Sam for those videos. A really great insight into the role fair trade plays in your business, and great to hear a little bit more about how how important the role of choosing fair trade for your products and your ingredients, both both food and cosmetics, uh, is, um, and to see those brands continue to grow and, and innovate as well. Um, so now we will have an opportunity to ask a couple of questions to our amazing panelists. Um, but whilst I'll give you the opportunity to think about that, um, we're just going to launch our second poll, uh, which should be coming on your screen now. Um, when we're, please use the Q&A function um, to, to put some questions in and, and have a look at this question now, which is, which ingredients are you interested in hearing more about from Fairtrade? Um, you can select multiple uh, multiple questions or suggest uh, multiple ingredients or suggest other uh, ingredients that aren't on there. Um, and whilst we're doing that, I'm just going to have a look at the Q&A function, um, see some of the questions that come in. First one, uh, I'm just going to go over to you, Tommy, uh, which is a question we've had in, in how is climate change affecting farmers in Kerala? Well, as I speak to you now, you know, you should have had rains battering on the windows and I should have been barely audible. Uh, whereas at the moment I am sitting on warm, sunny Kerala and talking to you. Uh, the monsoons legendarily hit Kerala coast on the 1st of June. And for the next three months, we have rain and more rain alone. Uh, that is not the case this year. If you want to have just a straight view on how climate change is affecting Kerala. Uh, just to say the weather itself is definitely changing. But other than being anecdotal in that sense, I don't know if you realize, you know, probably there was, it made headline news at some point of time earlier. 2018 and 2019, Kerala had two back-to-back -back floods, which were considered once in a century floods. It, it affected the farming terrain irretrievably. It affected soil conditions and it affected cropping patterns. Cashew farms, for instance, have been directly affected because an unseasonal rain, even in normal situations, would affect the cashew yield. And therefore, if you have unpredictable weather as the norm rather than an exception, you would know that farmers' fortunes are going to be increasingly tried, uh, tied to, you know, to, to, to the fluctuations in weather. Uh, this year, our cashew season should have happened till May end. Our cashew season ended by around April uh, last week. Because you had unseasonal summer showers earlier and it would pay to the cashew crop. Uh, so climate change is real. Climate change is, is unfolding before our eyes. But at the same time, we are also clear that not just adaptation to this change in climate, but response in terms of mitigating climate change conditions also depend on the sensitivity of farming operations that we do. I mentioned earlier, we are in the Milgiri, we are in the Western Guards, which is a World Heritage Site. We are a part of or on the foothills of the Milgiri biosphere, which is one of the 10 biodiversity hot spots in the world. So the environmental sensitivity of our farming operations is critical, not just for the survival of our crop, but for the survival of a climate challenged planet. 
and therefore the adoption of climate sensitive farming practices therefore the importance of carbon neutral farming practices therefore the importance of adapting to increasing carbon sequestration measures and therefore the importance of tree crops one of which is cashew cashew coconut lot of cos products that aid the cosmetic and the wellness industry are all tree crops and if grown in a multi crop pattern or fashion can veritably be considered farm forest or food forest and they are clearly a climate mitigating activity and therefore small holders in more ways than one particularly in homestead farming conditions where they 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 avoid monocrop practices and foster steward multi crop plantations you have the answer to several climate uh, change challenges that we face Brilliant. Thank you, Tommy. Um, now, look, I'd, I'd like to kind of wrap up our discussion today by, by going back to both Anna uh, and, and to Tommy to just for a couple of final thoughts. Um, whilst I'm giving them just a moment to think, uh, we're going to launch our final poll, which is, is, having heard the webinar today, are you more likely to consider fair trade for your business? So that should be popping up on screen now. Perfect. Uh, and whilst people are answering that, Anna, I'll come over to you first on just, just a couple of final thoughts. Um, thanks, Will. Uh, yeah, I mean, so inspiring to hear from the businesses who have made these decisions and then Tommy directly on what it's like for a farmer. I think the key piece, and it, it kind of came through in the Q&A for those we didn't speak to and some of the comments is we, the, pre the minimum price and premium is only paid on fair trade sales. And that's the, the standards exist for the whole um, of the sub farming cooperative or the farm, but they need those sales as fair trade in order to access the resources to meet our standards and for all of this work that we've speak, um, spoken about to you know, mitigate and adapt to climate change. So I just, my final reflection would just be to encourage any business who's thinking about it. It's not too complicated. We're here to help pick a supply chain if you feel overwhelmed by it um, and see which one you know, matches your risk or your brand profile and how you can make the biggest impact. And then talk to us at Fair Trade because if we start paying that premium and that minimum price, and we can get more businesses doing that with us, we'll deliver more impact for these farmers at a time that they really need it. Brilliant. Thanks, Anna. Tommy, over to you for a final thought. Uh, uh, well, to start with farming and to look at farming as an activity that needs to be pursued responsibly. Uh, particularly against some of the most existential challenges that we face today in, you know, in terms of climate change. I think smallholder farmers who align themselves with justice-tuned supply chains globally is an extremely important uh, you know, piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Sensitive farmers tied to link to justice-tuned marketplaces. So that's the only way sensitive farming practices can be sustained. And those sensitive farming practices do not just answer the farmer's uh, you know, reality. They, in fact, are the answer to a climate challenged planet that, you know, on which our common human destiny is tied. Up the supply chain, I think it's extremely important that today the concerns around a fair stake for everybody in the supply chain. Yes, starting with the farmers, but moving up across the supply chain to workers in factories, to workers finally in the stores that finally dispense these products onto the shopping bags of customers. There's a large stakeholder group of farmers, and it's extremely important that we ensure that this across stakeholders, a fairness becomes key. And cashew or products like this a fair trade supply chain is something that emphasis lays its emphasis on this. It's just not fairness, or sorry, it's just not organic so that our health is protected, or it's just not organic so that the planet is protected. It is fair. So organic and fair, how we are fair by the planet and how we are fair by, the, by our fellow human beings necessarily have to merge, and I think supply chains that focus on trade justice, fair trade, other labels that look at sustainable and fair supply chains are doing precisely that. And I think the more we 
we align ourselves with that with that global movement i think we serve our cause and our children's cause uh, for the better thank you i think you've, you've summarized that beautifully tommy thank you so much for both of you and once again thanks both anna and tommy um, and Sam and Deborah for being part of such an interesting discussion today. Um, I hope the rest of the audience have enjoyed this as, as much as I have. Um, thank you all for taking the time out of your mornings, uh, very early morning in Peru, as we found out earlier, uh, to, to join us today. Um, if you've been inspired by today's discussion and want to find out more, have questions or, or want to kind of understand how you can kind of get involved with fair trade, um, please do kind of reach out. There's an email address, I think, going into the chat now, uh, which you should be able to contact us on. Um, but on, other than that, just a massive thank you again to our, our panel and contributors today. Thank you all for joining us. Um, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, so indeed. Thank Thanks, you. Matt.